Ossabaw Island is one of the eight major barrier islands located along Georgia's 100-mile coast. Ossabaw is the third largest barrier island, totaling 26,000 acres. 11,000 acres are what we call uplands, or the area you can walk around on. The remaining 15,000 acres are comprised of marshes, creeks, and wetlands. Ossaba Island is a 20-minute boat ride from Savannah. The island has been inhabited for the past 5,000 years. The Gwali, who were the aboriginal people, lived, hunted, fished, and harvested oysters on Ossaba Island. 1,500 years ago, approximately 3,000 Gwali Indians lived in the middle of the island in a large village. When you visit Cane Patch or Middle Place on Ossaba, you can see the remnants of their landfills, called middens, filled with oyster shells, which were their fast food wrappers. Asaba is a native word meaning place of the yopon holly. Yopon is a holly plant native to North America and the Georgia coast. Its leaves have caffeine and the stimulant found in dark chocolate. The Gwali and other native tribes prize this caffeinated tea. They brewed it for every day and special ceremonies. In this image from the 1500s, you can see the confused European soldiers in the lower left corner. The women on the right are brewing the tea, straining the leaves, and serving the tea in shells. And the warriors who have fasted for three days and now will drink large quantities of the tea will purge or throw up. The European's Latin name for this plant is Elix vomitorium, which translates roughly to the vomit holly. In 1733, when England's Oglethorpe arrived in what is now Georgia, the native population was a fraction of its former size due to the long-time presence of Europeans in the region. European diseases were killing the native population. The Spanish colonizers enslaved many tribes and pitted different tribes against each other to increase the likelihood of war. In this image, we see Yamakra Chief Tomochichi and his nephew to the left. Tomochichi's agreement with Oglethorpe set aside Georgia's barrier islands for the remaining native people to hunt and fish. Standing on Oglethorpe's right is Mary Musgrove, his half-Scot, half-Creek Indian interpreter. In 1749, Mary Musgrove and her third husband, Reverend Thomas Bosomworth, petitioned the trustees of Georgia, stating that Mary was not fully compensated for her time as Oglethorpe's interpreter during the establishment of the Georgia colony. Ultimately, she was awarded the three barrier islands once set aside for the Native people. She was granted ownership of Ossaba, St. Catharines, and Sapelo Islands. In 1759, she received payment from the Crown in exchange for her ownership of Ossaba and Sapelo. But she retained St. Catharines, where she lived until her death in 1765. In 1760, Ossaba Island left native hands and was sold to an Englishman. The man who bought Ossaba Island was speculating in real estate, just like investors today. The ban against slavery in colonial Georgia was overturned in 1750 due to pressure from Georgia's neighbors in South Carolina, who wanted to expand their plantation economy of enslaving Africans for free labor. If you look closely, you can see that Gray Elliott had Ossaba Island divided into several 500-acre plantations. Mr. Elliott made money by, quote, flipping Ossaba Island but only one person bought the entire island, Henri Francois Borquin. He bought it for his daughter and her husband, John Morrell. John Morrell was not a planter. He was a merchant in Savannah, but he quickly purchased an estate in Augusta, Georgia, of 30 enslaved people, including women and children. He continued to enslave these people on Ossaba Island. The enslaved live oaked Ossaba. This is the process of harvesting timber for shipbuilding. John Morrell's enslaved men built ships on the island. In addition to clearing the land of trees, this readied the island for planting of indigo. 
Approximately 300 acres of Asaba Island was planted in Indigo sufruticosa, an indigo plant from South and Central America. The leaves are processed to create an indigo cake pictured in the lower left corner. Indigo cake was exported to Great Britain to be used in the textile mills. Prior to 1883, the only way to create a blue dye was from indigo and a few other plants. Georgia and South Carolina's coastal colonial plantations, including Osaba Island, created indigo dye cakes for export. Using the enslaved West Africans' knowledge and expertise about indigo. Indigo production was very profitable for the plantation owner. Great Britain paid an extra incentive to planters to encourage them to grow and process indigo. Eventually, indigo became less profitable because the British began importing indigo from India. Sea Island cotton became the main crop across Osaba Island. In this photo, you can see how tall the Sea Island cotton plants were and how big and fluffy the cotton bowl grew. This cotton is synonymous with Egyptian or Pima cotton. It has long, silky fibers that create the finest cloth. It took lots of skill from the enslaved to correctly process the bowls of the Sea Island cotton, thus earning the most profit for the enslavers. By the early 1800s, Asaba Island had four plantations. On each plantation lived 68 to 70 enslaved workers who grew Sea Island cotton, corn for the plantation animals, and food for themselves. Families lived in duplex cabins they constructed. Two to six people lived in a 324 square foot room. Everyone worked on Asaba Island, including children. African descendants lived on Asaba Island for four generations as enslaved people from 1760 to 1865. At the close of the Civil War in 1865, liberation came for the islands enslaved. Some of Asaba's freedmen were awarded land on Asaba as part of Field Order 15 that promised land on the Sea Islands to the formerly enslaved. This promise was short-lived. Field Order 15 was repealed by President Andrew Johnson after President Abraham Lincoln's assassination. The land was restored to the former owners. This turn of events left Asaba's freedmen and women to continue farming for their previous owners for little or no pay through the sharecropping system. The Sea Island storms of 1893 and 1898 changed people's fates. Two Category 5 hurricanes hit the area in August and again in October, both in 1893 and 1898. The storms destroyed houses and other buildings and ruined the fields by covering them with a storm surge of salt water. Asaba's freed people and their descendants wanted a new life, and they wanted to own their own land. Asaba's black sharecropping population left the island. Many of them bought land in Pinpoint, Georgia, on the Back River, now the Moon River, in Chatham County. The land was not considered desirable by its owner, Judge Henry McAlpin, who sold it to many of Asaba's people. Today, the streets are named for the people who first bought property in Pinpoint. Pinpoint is the Savannah area's last Gullah Geechee community. In the 1880s, Asaba Island's plantations were sold to wealthy people looking to escape the harsh northern winters and to enjoy hunting on the island. Some descendants of the once enslaved came back and worked for these landowners as hunting guides. Asaba's most well-known 20th century owners are the family of Dr. Henry and Nell Ford Torrey of Gross Point, Michigan. They purchased Asaba Island in 1924. This is a portrait of Mrs. Torrey, her son Bill, and her daughter Eleanor, also known as Sandy. Eleanor Sandy Torrey West spearheaded Asaba's preservation. She died January 2021 on her 108th birthday. This is the Torrey family home in Michigan, which gives you an idea of their wealth. This was their first winter home in Savannah, located at Greenwich, next to Bonaventure Cemetery. 
This house burned in 1923 when the family was in residence. Sandy and her nurse jumped from a second floor window to escape. The Tories did not rebuild and bought Osaba Island as their new winter retreat. They built a 20,000 square foot house on Osaba Island. It took two years to build and was completed in 1926. After her parents' deaths, beginning in 1961, Sandy West and her husband, Clifford West, hosted retreats and educational visits for writers, artists, scientists, musicians, college and university groups for about 30 years. They used the 1926 house as the headquarters. The Osaba Island Project for established professionals and the Genesis Project for college students exhausted her money, as did managing the island. With additional pressure of rising taxes, pressure from private developers, and the threat of offshore mining, she realized her family could no longer afford to own the island and that its very existence as a wild place was threatened. She had to protect Osaba Island. In 1977 and 1978, President Jimmy Carter encouraged Sandy and her family to sell the island to the state of Georgia, who would protect it through the use of the 1975 Heritage Preserve Act that Carter put in place when he was Georgia's governor. Sandy and her family agreed to sell Osaba Island after the state of Georgia assured them that Osaba would be set aside for natural, scientific, cultural study, research, and education. They agreed to sell Osaba to the state of Georgia for $8 million, half of its appraised value. But the state did not have $8 million. Coca-Cola President Robert Woodruff learned of this opportunity and wanted Osaba Island for the citizens of Georgia, so he contributed $4 million towards the sale of the island. The taxpayers of Georgia paid $4 million for Osaba Island. Osaba became Georgia's first heritage preserve property. This is the highest level of protection for state-owned property. There are now 120 heritage preserve properties across Georgia. Georgia's Department of Natural Resources manages the island and the infrastructure. The roads, the docks, and the ecosystem. They organize seven managed hunts a year. The Osaba Island Foundation, an independent nonprofit organization, has a use agreement with the state of Georgia to organize and lead the natural, scientific, cultural study, research, and education programs on the island. We are the advocates and champions for the island's preservation. Since 1998, we have stabilized, renovated, and restored 11 historic buildings on Osaba Island. These 11 buildings are now managed by the Osaba Island Foundation. We look forward to your visit so you can learn more about the voices and the mystery of Osaba Island. <laughs>